Jody is tuning in from UC Berkeley today. Um, she comes to us from British Columbia, Canada originally, where many of you may know that a massive mountain pine beetle outbreak affected over 10 million hectares of the province in the 2000s. Since coming to California just over a year ago, Jody has focused her extension activities on drought and bark beetle driven mortality across the state. She's participating on the Governor's Tree Mortality Task Force and doing extension work in the Sierra Nevada. And these experiences provided doc Dr. Axelson an opportunity to see the extensive tree mortality firsthand and to identify existing knowledge gaps. In the past summer, Jody has started two research projects. One is focused on quantifying different ecosystem elements of the mortality event along a south to north transect in the Sierra Nevada. And the other one is using drones to determine if early detection of bark beetle infestations is possible. So I'm, I feel lucky that I was able to wrangle Jody for this webinar um, and sort of allow her schedule to uh, fit with ours during her um, field work. So I feel really excited to introduce her today and I am going to turn it over to her. So I'll put those links in the chat pod and um, give her your attention. Thank you. Thank you for joining, and I am sitting here in sunny, cool Berkeley, California, and excited to talk about bark beetles. I'm going to talk about bark beetle outbreaks uh, across Western North America, and talk a little bit about the causes, why, we, why these insects uh, have outbreaks, some of the control, and what are the consequences of these, uh, what can often be very large landscape level events. Uh, right from the beginning, I want to say that there is a, a wonderful breadth of uh, research on this topic and so I'm synthesizing a lot of what uh, other people have done in, on, this, on this topic and in the end we'll talk a little bit about some of the work I'm writing up right now on uh, Mount Pine Beetle outbreaks in Alberta. This is just a you know fairly brief list of some native bark beetles in Western North America that are uh, capable of having large landscape level outbreaks. There's a lot on the list um, that are active in the forests sort of all of the time and either an endemic situation. But these are the ones we kind of know really well. Mountain pine beetle, this is, uh, this is a beetle that's been in the news a lot between outbreaks in British Columbia, Montana, Idaho, Colorado, uh, as well as spruce beetle. These two are kind of the big eruptive beetles that we really think about impacting just enormous amounts of the landscape. As we can see on the left hand, uh, the right hand side of this table, we sort of have some of their hosts, some of the common hosts of these insects. So mountain pine beetle sort of is the largest generalist of this group in many ways in that it, it attacks many, many different types of pine trees. Uh, luckily, through Barbara Bence's uh, recent work, we know that bristlecone pine is not a suitable host for mountain pine beetle, which is great news given this is the longest lived tree on the planet spruce beetle going after different spruces. Western pine beetle has been getting a lot of attention in California due to a fairly large outbreak of this insect and it's it's quite targeted on ponderosa pine and coulter pines. And then of course we have the different ips that are affecting more of our, our more desert southwest regions of the west, pine engravers, um, and fur beetle down at the bottom, ascolitis. So all of these beetles can uh, have population sort of eruptions and impact fairly large areas on the landscape. And this is sort of how we think about bark beetles. This is often how they are um, portrayed in the media. This is from a Mother Jones article. Um, we don't notice bark beetles until there's a lot of dead trees, basically. And so I thought this was sort of a funny way to introduce bark beetles. Oh. So, Bark beetles are natural thinning agents. The insects that I'm talking about in today's talk are native bark beetles. And so they've been having outbreaks for millennia. You know, there's some really interesting lake core work that shows actual beetle fragments um, preserved in the sediment record from 8,000 years ago. This is Andrea Brunel and others' work. And so, you know, this photo sort of shows this thinning opportunity that beetles can create. They have this preference for larger trees. So they're taking out those large trees from the landscape and they create gaps. And within those gaps, maybe you get release of existing trees uh, that are in the understory or you get kind of a regeneration pulse. Bark beetles, of course, from that last slide we saw are very host specific as well. So they're only targeting you know, their preferred size and their preferred hosts. And so 
I think it's good to try to think about beetles as a holistic and natural part of the environment. There is an except, and that except is when they outbreak, they can impact an enormous amount of land area. So this is an example of a photograph taken over British Columbia during the mountain pine beetle outbreak that started in the late 1990s and, you know, just sort of uh, ended in the late, the late 2000s, uh, early 2010 time period. Uh, this impacted over 10 million hectares of land area. And so for folks who think in acres, that's over 25 million acres. So that's a really large outbreak. You know, in the upper right-hand corner, what we're, what we're seeing, uh, our upper left, sorry, in the, is uh, the amount of area affected by the mountain pine beetle in British Columbia since we started to do record keeping. And so we see, you know, the 1930s is this tiny blip, some activity in the 1950s. The 1970s, we start to see a larger outbreak, and by that 1990s and 2000s outbreak, it just skyrockets. And so this ends up being an extremely significant uh, impact to uh, the economy and the ecology of British Columbia. And so I think that's why we think about bark beetles a little bit like this, because this can happen when you get a very eruptive population dynamic uh, and the right ecological condition. And so let's talk a little bit about why outbreaks happen. Uh, this is from Ken Rafa's work, and it's a really complicated diagram, and it speaks to the complicated nature of bark beetle outbreaks. So what we see here on the, on the far left of this schematic are the different thresholds. So there's different sequence of thresholds that must be crossed in order for um, there to be establishment of an outbreak and that results in this sort of landscape level eruption. This middle column speaks to the endogenous controls within the system. So these are the internal controls on the uh, likelihood of beetles surpassing a particular threshold. And so at the top here we see um, you know, bark beetle biology, we see the local density, the actual uh, nature of the tree, so the phloem thickness, uh, microbial symbionts, and then you go down, and so these are all things that are impacting the ability for this sort of thing to happen, stand to landscape level eruptions. And on the far right, we have uh, exogenous controls in the system, so these are outside uh, controls and things that can release the uh, bark beetle biology. So drought, biotic stresses on the host. This is a really big one, and this is a really big one in California. I'll speak about that in a little while. Temperature also plays a huge role. You know, we see this especially in boreal and uh, high elevation systems. Geophysical barriers. This is an interesting. This is an interesting one because. As far as we knew, Mount Pine Beetle had never outbreaked in the, in the Canadian Northern Rocky Mountains. You know, we'd known that they had outbreaks in the Southern Rocky Mountains on the, on the uh, Montana-Idaho border, but they'd never been farther north. This last Mountain Pine Beetle outbreak, they, they surpassed this geophysical barrier of the, of the Canadian Rocky Mountains and are now in what Alan Carroll um, refers to as sort of a naive host. They're, they're, in a, they're in a stand of lodgepole, jack pine that segues across the, the entire boreal um, in a group of trees that aren't, aren't uh, kind of co-evolved to deal with, with this insect. And so perhaps we get this regime shift. This is uh, just a brand new paper uh, by Rupert uh, Seidel and others. And it's a really interesting piece of work because what they did is they took papers from 1990 onwards and they analyzed uh, over 670 papers for all of these different uh, disturbance types. And what they did is they quantified, uh, based on all of this meta-analysis, to what extent different disturbances are driven by direct effects, so climate, so these are the unmediated impacts of climate on a disturbance process. The indirect effects up here, 
which uh, describe how climate may influence disturbances through uh, effects on the vegetation or on some other process. And then below this interaction effect, which really refers to the disturbance interest, the disturbance of interest being influenced by other disturbance agents. And so cumulatively across all of these different disturbance types, climate uh, at 57% was sort of responsible for the different disturbances. So the width of this arrow shows its relative uh, importance for these different disturbances. And so a lot of these drought, not surprisingly, is driven directly by climate. Fire, very strong effect of climate. Uh, disease, also a very strong effect. When we get to insects, it's really a mix. You know, we have roughly 30% is an indirect effect, 30% is a climatic effect, and the biggest, uh, the thickest arrow, but not by a lot, is this interaction effect. So around 41% of disturbances driven by an interaction of some uh, level of climate and potentially other disturbance. So this is an interesting way to look at how insects fit in with this sort of this grand scheme of other disturbances that operate on our landscapes. This figures from Nate McDowell and others, and this was a this paper was a big deal because we started to see, um, you know, people started to think about global scale uh, tree mortality dieback events, and so that top figure, all those dots are showing. Um, where documented mortality has been associated with droughts since the 1970s. And then this bottom figure is actually adapted from the work that Rafa did that I showed you earlier that's showing eruptions of spruce beetle, mountain pine beetle, and pinion ips throughout the western uh, U.S. and Canada. And so mountain pine beetles in red, spruce beetle in green. These graphs here are showing us the cumulative amount of area that's being impacted by these insects from 1998 onward and together they impacted 47 million hectares of area which is a really uh, enormous amount. The red lines in these diagrams are showing that uh, the time period during which these insects were active that uh, it's the proportion of the outbreak period that was significantly re related to climate deviations. So in this case, they looked at 30-year means of climate and were primarily looking at uh, summer temperature anomalies and percentage of spring rain. And so we see for the building period of these two insects, spruce beetle and mountain pine beetle, they're very much... Um, as these populations increase, they're very much related to sort of these climatic anomalies. But at some point, when that line turns black, they are no longer being influenced by a climatic anomaly. So we can think about this as sort of climate was sort of an inciting factor that allowed these populations to build. But once they were very high, you know, there was no longer kind of um, these departures from normal conditions. So they're released from climate, and so they just keep going. I often make the analogy that sometimes these dendroctonists specifically uh, outbreaks are feel like a little bit like a runaway train. And so climate's not stopping them at this point. And so it's some other thing that creates that crash. Pinion nips is interesting because during this period here that they have this um, area impacted by pinion nips, it's always in a period of climatic anomaly. And so pinion ips potentially is, a never, is, is more of a flashy outbreak. It, the insect is never really released from um, that climatic stress period. And, you know, my last year in California and seeing how hard the western pine beetle is crashing, I'm starting to think that probably western pine beetle looks a lot like this, uh, at least in California. This to mainly follow on with the uh, pinion ips example is work that uh, Connie Millar and Nate Stevenson presented. It's actually a figure adapted from work by Park Williams. And so what we're going to see, I'll set up these graphs for you, is on this right-hand axis is a forest drought uh, stress index. And so what this index integrates is the effects of warm season water deficit 
and this is mainly being controlled by high temperatures and cold season precipitation. So as the numbers for this index go negative, it's becoming drier, more sort of a greater forest drought stress. On the left here, we have different things. And so on the top, I'll just walk through, starting from the top all the way to the bottom, we have uh, the normalized difference of vegetation index. This is a, this is a remotely sensed um, index of greenness. And so from our bottom axes here, 1980 to 2015, we see greenness decreasing in the southwestern states. And we also see this increasing by this negative number, increasing forest drought stress. If we look at the next one, this is the percentage of trees that are dead. So you have pinion pine, ponderosa pine in blue, and Douglas fir in green. Now, they flipped the forest drought severity uh, index for the rest of these graphs, and that's sort of just to facilitate um, the, recognizing the patterns. So as drought stress has increased, this red line, it's now a six-year smooth line, we see this coinciding pattern of mortality in these different species centered around the late 2000s. For bark beetle area, we see this quite strong relationship between the amount of kilometer squared area in this golden line uh, over time and the increased in drought severity. Again, now it's a two-year smooth line. And then wildfire area. So as your area of wildfire increases, so is the forest drought severity index. So this kind of shows quite nicely these relationships, this sort of interactive relationship that uh, the meta-analysis presented earlier showed. Now I arrived to a really big drought in California. So I got here last year and you know there was just this incredible drought. And it started in roughly 2011, 2012. And this is work by Greg Asner where you know at the Carnegie Institute, they've been able to fly over the entire state and used uh, some very high tech stuff to drive this uh, canopy water stress uh, metric. And so this is progressive canopy, stra uh, canopy water stress over the 2011 to 2015 period. The hotter the color, the higher the water stress, right? And so canopy water content is sort of the total amount of liquid water in the canopy and it's an indica indicator of uh, not only drought stress, but vegetation flammability and maybe, you know, the potential for some of these trees to die. This black, these big black blobs are fires, so they completely excluded that from the analysis. So we get this picture of cumulative uh, drought stress within the state of California. And um, we can look at how this drought stress impacts western uh, this is, this is bark beetle mortality in total, so mountain pine beetle, uh, ips, western pine beetle. But what we know from this last event is a lot of the damage, uh, a lot of the mortality was concentrated in the ponderosa pine. So this is data from the Forest Health Protection Aerial Survey Program. And so on this left axis, we see the percentage of the flown area with mortality. So zero to 16, and these are those red bars. What we see, on the right axis in this blue line is uh, precipitation departure. So taking the full amount of precipitation from October to September, so that's considered the water year, and the uh, degree of deviation from the long-term 20th century average. So anything above this dashed zero line is a wet period and anything below this line is a dry period. And so here's this El Nino event in 1997-98. Uh, that was quite a large event. And what, we, what this graph is really pointing out is that during these wet periods, the bark beetle mortality is very low in the state of California. And that as we start to see these departures from the long-term average in terms, of, in terms of a drying effect, we see these peaks in bark beetles. This 2003 through, through 2005, um, was a western pine beetle outbreak concentrated in the San Bernardino Mountains that crashed quite quickly. But that population actually stayed quite elevated through the rest of the 2000s as we sort of climatically shifted between this wetter through drier period. And then here in 2000, 
you know, starting in 2012, we see this strong departure from normal, the largest uh, departure from normal in this record. And what we also know from tree ring records, so work by um, Dan Griffin and Kevin Anchikaitis, is this drought was, you know, the worst drought in the last 1,200 years. Uh, as we see this negative anomaly, we really start to see the bark beetle numbers increase in that mortality increase. And so this really shows nicely that disturbance interaction uh, in this dry Mediterranean climate with drought. And so control. And control is a topic people have really varying uh, opinions about. And, you know, Barb Benz has, has stated and written that there is no way to control a bark beetle outbreak uh, once it is a landscape scale event, and I completely agree with that. Um, but when we are controlling, when we try to control insects, whether they're bark beetles or whether they're um, defoliators, we never do so thinking we're going to eradicate the pest. You know, my previous job, I worked uh, with the BC Forest Service, and, and we were having a 20-year outbreak of the Western Spruce Budworm, which is a native defoliator across the range of Douglas fir, and so we would treat that insect, um, never with the intent of eradicating the insect, but trying to minimize the damage. And, you know, the efficacy studies we could do, the monitoring we could do following those treatments demonstrated a nice decrease in the local population. And so I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to make that sort of caveat statement that when I'm talking about control, I'm talking about at the very low levels of an outbreak or before an outbreak's even begun, right? Just when you start to notice that mortality, that's when I believe we can have an impact. I really like this uh, table I've adapted from um, Justin DeRose and, and, um, and Long's work uh, around resistance and resilience. And what they really do is they take a, a rich literature on these subjects and they apply, the, apply it to silviculture. And so what they mean when they say resistance in this paper is that these two different scales, the stand scale and the landscape scale, resistance is how the structure and composition of a stand impacts the level of either mortality at that stand scale or the transition from endemic, so a very low population to a high population. So the way that the landscape sets up this disturbance to occur. The way they refer to resilience is what happened after the disturbance. So it's the idea that uh, it's, the, it's the influence of the disturbance on the subsequent structure. So it says it right here. So a system is resilient uh, when there's still trees or maybe there's still live uh, large live host trees, the so trees that would have been susceptible to, in the case of this paper, they're talking specifically about fire and uh, spruce beetle. And then again, it, from this, these are very similar, but you scale this up to the landscape proportion. And so they're different concepts, but they're, I think they're interesting moving forward because one of the, one of the control, the direct control uh, options that we have is to modify the stand. This may reduce, this, this might change the way a disturbance can, can propagate on the landscape, and it may change the outcome after the disturbance has passed. Uh, I've started looking at these old historical images uh, taken around California, mainly in the 30s and 40s, and they're a wonderful peek back into time. And so one of the direct things we can do on the landscape is, is to change forest structure. And so the work of Malcolm North and Eric Knapp and others at the Pacific uh, Research um, Centers with the US Forest Service have shown us historically that the landscape was a lot more clumpy and gappy. And this is particularly true of, of the Sierra Nevada where um, you have mixed conifer types and a lot of uh, very dramatic elevation. This is probably less true in, in areas of the central interior of British Columbia that are really sort of fire-driven systems where you get a lot of, of uh, lodgepole pond and maybe parts of Montana. But you know what this photograph points 
toward is uh, there is heterogeneity in this stand. And we've lost a lot of that heterogeneity. heterogeneity. We hear over and over again the role that fire suppression has, has played in not only densifying our forests, but also creating more homogeneity. So in this picture, what I see in, for scale here uh, is a car and a person standing beside this massive ponderosa pine. As we see a range of species, a range of sizes, um, there's obviously a large gap here, and this is why all this, this uh, regeneration has established. And so I think we need to look at moving our landscapes toward uh, not restoration, not trying to recreate the past, but creating some heterogeneity, not only in the species, but the age structures. Bark beetles, especially dendroctinous bark beetles, go after the larger trees. Um, and that's largely a function of the phloem thickness, right? And so if a bark beetle was to wipe through this stand, all of these smaller trees would be largely untouched. Uh, the incense cedar would not be attacked. The sugar pine, if it was a western pine beetle, would not be attacked. Um, and so there would, there would be a lot of residual structure after an event like this. This is the last I'll show of a historical photo, but this is, this is also an example of, you know, I deleted it from the caption because all of these photos have caption, but this one says poorly stocked. Uh, what I find funny about that is, um, obviously this was a forest inventory and that's why these images were taken. But this is ponderosa pine, sugar pine, and black oak type. And this is probably the density at which uh, all of those species can exist on the landscape. And it certainly does not look like that now. And so I think the larger thing we need to look at uh, across the Intermountain West uh, in both Canada and the U.S. is how, um, how do we help forest structures, the structure and the composition, um, how, how to have it exist in a way, what we can do to modify it so that it is more resistant to disturbance. We don't set up necessarily these large outbreaks, um, although large outbreaks are likely going to happen at some point anyways, and are they going to be resilient? And again, this idea isn't universally um, accepted either because there's this idea that there's climate adaptation and who are we to say what are the trees to take out and the trees to leave? Nature does this for us. And for sure, through bark beetle outbreaks, nature does do this for us. I'm now going to talk about uh, some of the direct mechanisms we can uh, do to, and again, control was the wrong, wrong word probably. It's a nice alliteration. It's mainly mitigate. It's uh, mainly to minimize damage by these insects. And so this is an example of the most southeastern corner of British Columbia. And... The idea with sanitation harvests, sort of the beginning of an integrated pest management strategy, is you maximize the extraction of currently infested trees to reduce the damage and minimize the spread. And this is, the, this is uh, at the scale we're talking about, we're at the stand to the landscape scale. In British Columbia, we have a thing called bark beetle management units, so it's quite hard to see, but all these little faint gr gray lines are indicating uh, a type of a, bar a bark beetle management unit. And depending on the susceptibility rating, what your insect populations are, followed up by ground monitoring, your ability to treat the insect, you come up with these different strategies. So the darkest green color is the suppression strategy. And the strategy there is really to remove at least a minimum uh, of 80% of infested material. And this is to try to minimize the spread. And then as you move through these colors, you have monitor. So these are areas of the landscape that have very low risk of, of in this case, mountain pine beetle uh, impacting the area. So it's just a monitor. Uh, and often with bark beetles, you know, that runaway train effect happens. You get very high mortality and you're not stopping it. You're in a salvage uh, situation at that point. Jody, I have a quick question for you. When you yeah. say when you say the technique there is just removing the affected trees, what technique are they using to remove? Is it is it just felling the trees and actually physically removing them or chipping them or what are they doing? 
yeah, it is, it is removing them uh, through harvesting practices. So in salvaging, the trees are dead, the beetles have flown, right? And this is the classic thing is people don't tend to notice bark beetles until the trees are red. Well, by that time, the trees are, are dead and the, the bark beetle has flown away. So there is no forest health benefit to removing those trees. When we're doing suppression activities, we are taking currently infested trees that still have live beetles in them. So they haven't finished their uh, life cycle and we are felling them. They could be chipped, they could be debarked, um, they could be taken to mills where they're debarked and effectively the bark beetles are, are destroyed. Um, Region eight in the US Southeast uh, does this with Southern pine beetle, it's very effective. Um, it can be very effective. Now, southern pine beetle biology is a little different. As soon as you fall those trees, you arrest the development of the beetle. In the western states, spruce beetle, mountain pine beetle, western pine beetle, simply falling the tree isn't going to arrest the development of the beetle necessarily. So then you need to deal with it. So it either needs to be milled, chipped, burned, um, and whatnot. Uh, as also part of this strategy, I would say having trap trees, uh, where you fall down a healthy green tree and that brings in the beetles um, and then you get rid of that tree is also sort of what I think of as suppressive suppression tactic. The requirements of using this is the infestation size. You have to be able to meet that 80% target or there really is no point. You know, Ellen Carroll's work has shown that. A very extensive review of the literature Diana Six did has shown that. Timing is critical. Once the beetles are flown, you are doing salvage. You are not helping forest, uh, forest health per se. Uh, the manage, uh, sorry, that's my, that's getting blocked. Harvesting practices and debris management. So these are really essential pieces of a suppression tactic. Then we move on through that kind of the integrated pest management spectrum to uh, using pheromones, so manipulating the bark beetle, and so. There are pheromones that can either attract, and I've highlighted the word repel, bark beetles. And I highlight repel because that's often what we're trying to do. Uh, it's generally only timber management companies that may want to attract the beetle because they already have a, a timber harvest planned. And so we're trying to repel the bark beetle. And so this can be effective at the stand or to the individual tree scale. And so what we're seeing on the far left is the application of uh, a verbenome in a splat formulation. And so this was a nice adaptation of uh, what we normally thought of as the pouches, this timed released synthetic pheromone. It's being applied um, using just a regular caulking gun and being applied directly to the bowl of the tree. Now, what's really important with pheromones is not all pheromones work equally across different bark beetles. And I, and I think um, people always want to try to save their trees and they want to try to do something. And we need to be aware as professionals, um, especially people in the urban landscape, that we should not be selling people things that will not work. And so verbenone works for mountain pine beetle. Verbenone Plus has some demonstrated uh, ability to inhibit western pine beetle, but the studies are sort of, the jury's out on that one. It's, sometimes it's shown to be effective and sometimes it's, sometimes it's not. Um, and so these are really important to keep in mind. This is a very nice publication that talks about pheromone protection for trees. This uh, photo accompanied the, the webinar um, advertisement. I think it's kind of funny just because, uh, mostly because I'm wearing cork boots in a dry fir forest, but I was putting up MCH. And this was a really good candidate stand. We had low levels of Douglas fir bark beetle. We were stapling up MCH pouches. Um, on this sort of isolated population. And so we've seen some nice uh, demonstrated efficacy on, on that, again, at a low population level. And then finally, we have uh, protection of individual trees. And, and this is for homeowners that have a beautiful tree they definitely don't want to lose. This is, uh, or a campsite that has a, a tree they definitely don't want to use. These are applied at the individual tree level and they are expensive. And so you have sprays, so they could be either carbaryl or pyrethroid-based sprays, and you'll get a number of um, you'll get a number of years, one to two, maybe three, of protection based on those. And then this new technology, which are injectables. Um, the nice thing about some of the injectables is you have much less target effect, uh, non-target effect. So 
impacting insects other than the ones that are boring into that tree. Um, and so emectin, emectin benzoate is, a, is an example. So uh, triage, I think, is one of the commercial chemical names. And so this is where you are putting in these, um, these sort of almost like a needle and you're pressurizing the product into the tree. Now the timing again is really important with this. So for mountain vine beetle and spruce beetle, this only works in the fall when that tree is translocating in the year before they would actually be challenged by a bark beetle. And Western pine beetles, uh, some studies by Grossman and others have shown you can get up to three years of protection. So in California, this would need to be done very early in the spring when trees are actually actively translocating um, up to their, to their crowns because they are more than likely shutting down in the winter time or in the summertime when it gets so extremely dry. So Chris Fedig and others have done a lot of work on this. And this is again a, a, a single tree treatment. Um, but it is expensive. So you're going to be doing this um, at, at low numbers on your property. And so the consequences. And this is where my own research uh, area falls into actually, is uh, when I worked at the Canadian Forest Service, Renee Alfaro, and in my PhD, I was looking at what happens during and or after uh, large outbreaks of different insects. So for bark beetles, we can really think about in the short term, you have tree mortality, obviously. Those trees eventually fall down, so you have fuel loading. That word is grayed out because I think that's a, an entirely separate topic. Uh, you could do a whole webinar on the implications of fuel loads from bark beetle outbreaks. And then you have something that happens after. You have a... Uh, uh, Renee Alfaro actually coined this term, so I, shouldn't, I should give him credit. Life after beetle. Uh, maybe we need to think about life with beetle. Maybe we won't be living in a beetle-free world too much anymore. So I've looked at a large number of studies, uh, and there's really three main recovery trajectories after bark beetle. And so you could have regeneration and, in a forestry term, adequate stocking of the species that was lost. So in this case, this is central British Columbia on the, on the left, and this is showing a, a pine forest that is staying to pine. Um, and so pine keeps regenerating after successive bark beetle outbreaks. You can have a succession towards different shade tolerant species, and so that's occurring here on the right where we're seeing spruce come up in the understory. And in the Rocky Mountain states um, and a high elevation sites, an increase in aspen potentially. And so these little outcomes are really, really largely dependent on the initial forest structures the, and composition before the outbreak. The soil substrate and moisture conditions. So some species require a bare mineral soil to regenerate on. This pines and aspens are good examples. This is a special place in uh, British Columbia, actually, a lot of wildfires have been burning through this part of the central interior, the Chilcotin and the Caribou, and you have very thin soils. You actually have bare mineral soil. This is probably why pine does so well. Uh, and the degree of the mortality that's actually occurred. So this is going to dictate how much canopy opening you get uh, and how much light is going to come in, how much residual basal area you have in a stand. Just to wrap up, I'm going to show you some work I'm preparing right now. And this uh, is sort of one of these nice longitudinal studies that somebody decided to start in the 1980s. So Waterton Lakes National Park is in the far southwestern corner of Alberta and it borders Glacier National Park in Montana. Uh, very deeply dissected landscapes of Rocky Mountain peaks and then these lower elevation forests that are mainly dominated by pine. In the late 1970s and early 80s, there was a mountain pine beetle outbreak in this park, and being a national park, nothing was done. So it gave us an opportunity to see a long-term trajectory of, of recovery. And so the study was initiated by a CFS scientist in the 80s, and they were primarily interested in, in quantifying the degree of uh, overstory mortality. And so that gray bar, the light gray bar, is showing us the... Um, uh, the amount of trees that died in each of these five stands that were studied uh, with uh, trees per hectare on this axis and then the amount of trees that remained alive. So we see, you know, over a fairly small area at these low elevation stands, a great amount of variety in the amount of trees that died. And those red arrows are going to be uh, trees I'm going to 
stands, I'm going to show what happened. This is our low, more low mortality site. And so we only had 10% overstory mortality. Before the outbreak, so we took all the trees that had been recorded as dead by mountain pine beetle or Ips in 1981 when these stands were first measured, and we made them alive again. So, see, so we could see what was what the pre-outbreak condition looked like. This red color is lodgepole pine, and now our trees per hectare are on this uh, x-axis. And so here's a stand dominated by pine uh, that suffers a very minor amount of overstory mortality. Um, and as time goes on, so these, through these different remeasurement periods, we start to see an increase in some of the other species present. So interior spruce and dark blue, and uh, Douglas fir and subalpine fir in these, these green and teal colors. Now, the original scientists never thought to look at the understory, but Brad Hawks, who revisited this site with Renee Alfaro in the 2000s, was interested in this idea of what was happening in the understory. So we have saplings and we have regeneration. So the really little trees are the regeneration, the saplings are something that you can actually measure a breast height on even if it's really small. And what we see is in 2002 and 10 at these different measurement periods, you get uh, you have very low levels of saplings present in the stand. This is likely because the canopy didn't open up that much. And then regeneration is almost entirely subalpine fir. You know, this, this layer dies off a lot, so there's a lot less in 2010. In our intermediate mortality, the colors stay the same throughout all of these stands. So here we have nearly 30% overstory mortality. In the overstory, there, there always was a mix at this particular stand. Even before the outbreak, there was poplar, aspen, spruce, and very little bits of, uh, of subalpine fir in our understory. We have a, a much higher number compared to the last stand, so 1,600 trees per, he per hectare in 2010 of saplings, and they're almost all poplar, and that's interesting. In the regeneration layer, again, um, we're seeing this uh, complete conversion. And so this is, of those kind of outcomes I presented, this is a kind of a combination of the two. We're seeing increased aspen, and we're seeing a, a succession towards shade-tolerant species. This is our high mortality. So this, this stand uh, had over 93% or had around 93% trees killed by the outbreak. So we see this massive reduction in the pine component. Again, this was always a mixed species stand and it was also our stand with the lowest amount of starting uh, density. In the sapling layer, you see a little bit of pine. So it's probably open enough that we're seeing some pine in that layer, but we're not seeing it in the regeneration layer because the seed bed is probably incorrect. That soil substrate isn't uh, adequate. And so we have this sort of mix of, again, poplar, aspen, subalpine fir, and all those little tiny babies coming up, they are mostly, mostly subalpine fir. So that's sort of, uh, that study gives us, over that 30 year period, gives us some sense of the long-term impacts of bark beetle outbreaks. And, and really those are increased stand heterogeneity by being so excellent at fire suppression, we have really um, created much more homogenous landscapes that can be quite uh, susceptible to bark beetle outbreaks. In this, in this case, you know, in the Waterton case, perhaps there's a decreased susceptibility to there being a large mountain pine beetle outbreak in the future because now that host has been reduced. And some of the work by, um, Sarah Hart in the Southern Rocky Mountains has showed this dampening effect, some 1940 spruce beetle outbreaks. Um, enough, there was enough mortality and enough uh, increased heterogeneity in the stands that there was actually this decreased susceptibility to future outbreaks. And Renee O'Farrell and Lara Van Acker and others at the Canadian Forest Service have shown the same in central British Columbia to mountain pine beetle. So between this increased heterogeneity and this decreased susceptibility, maybe we start to get toward that resilience. Uh, piece. And abruptly, that's it. Thanks, Jody. Um, feel free to stop sharing your screen and open the Q&A if you want, or else just keep sharing your screen and you can open the Q&A. Um, I'm going to start reading off some of the questions that have popped up. Um, and just a real quick one. Maria asked, is that single tree treatment, is it done yearly? 
that single tree when you had like the, the really expensive one, I think is what she's referring to. Uh, generally, the injectables are, are good for two to three years. Uh, oh. So you can make that investment uh, once. If you have very high beetle populations, you're noticing a lot of trees in your area that are dying. Um, you might want to not push that third year and do it every two years. Um, but that has some demonstrated uh, efficacy for a, for a number of years. Okay. Um, you showed a diagram in the very beginning of your talk, um, which uh, had the interaction, the indirect, and the climate, um, all of those components to outbreaks. And I was wondering, do you remember the um, author of that paper or the title? Because I wanted to look it up. It looked really interesting. So that's uh, Rupert Seidel, or Seidel. Um, that just came out in 2017 in Nature Climate Change. Okay. Uh, cool. It's fantastic, uh, fantastic work and, and really neat. There's such a breadth of literature to, to analyze it in that way. Okay, good, thanks. Otis asked, does ver verbenone, I don't know how you say that, verb verbenone? Verbenone. Verbenone work for southern pine beetle. I am not actually sure about that. Uh, there's some ex excellent... Uh, U.S. Forest Service resources, and their publications are always free, that talk about uh, IPM for southern pine beetle. I'm not exactly sure. I, I would have to defer to a colleague that works in that insect more. I don't think so. I think okay. verbenone is specific to mountain pine beetle uh, okay. biology. Okay. Uh, Maria asked, um, she believed that somebody she knew said Bayer made a chemical for the trees to get rid of various insects. Would this work for the bark beetle, or is that something you know about, you're familiar with? Uh, I'm sure there's lots of chemicals on, on, the, on the landscape. I would, I would look at getting an arborist in, uh, preferably that has been referred to you by somebody that's dealt specifically with bark beetles, because they'll be able to point you to the products that will actually work. Um, so triage is sort of a chemical name for one of the injectables. That's the amectin benzoate. That's a commercial formulation. But, you know, the, the research is really out still, whether verbenone or verbenone plus does a really good job of protecting trees from western pine beetles. So you have to be careful. And I think using professionals that you trust that have demonstrated experience with the bark beetle population of interest is important. Because, you know, during these big outbreaks, people can sort of, you know, promote products that uh, aren't gonna work. And then you've paid a lot of money that, for something that's not gonna work anyway. Okay, um, any thoughts on biological controls for bark beetle, beetles? Biological controls as in like mating, well the pheromones are kind of a form of biological control because you're using the beetle's own uh, semiochemical biology to manipulate them. Uh, Bark beetles are very tricky. They defy landscape level treatments. Um, you know, they're feeding underneath the bark of trees. You know, for, for defoliators, we can spray a stand with like a Bacillus thurgensis, uh, which is very targeted on that Lepidoptera uh, that's chewing those needles. Bark beetles, there's nothing that direct. Um, you know, there's a lot of older work on mating disruption and, you know, basically it didn't work for bark beetles. And should that, some of that work be uh, reinvigorated, redone, you know, possibly, but. Okay. Lou asked, um, in Oregon, we have been told that only Ponderosa is really affected. Should urban foresters be looking to monitor Douglas fir for the beetle? So in Oregon, uh, different fur engravers are becoming, um, wood boring insects are becoming a problem for Douglas fir. So it's true, western pine beetle is not going to touch your Douglas firs. All of these beetles generally are very host specific. There is the Douglas fir beetle, which I left off the list. Um, in British Columbia, this insect can be a real problem. In California, it's never a problem. In Oregon, it's somewhere in the middle. Uh, what I know uh, from colleagues in Oregon, though, is that different fur uh, wood borers are kind of cycling up in, in unexpected ways in response to droughty conditions and killing Douglas firs. That's what you should be looking for on the Douglas fir. Um, they have very distinctive larvae, um, and I'm sure there's some really good uh, extension uh, materials out of particularly Oregon State University that would 
be uh, targeted toward uh, pests of Douglas fir. Okay. David Coyle um, had a couple comments. I think he must be from the South. Um, he said, maybe I missed it. Did um, Jody mention if forest thinning can positively impact forest health and whether can it help or can it help reduce mountain pine beetle infestations? This strategy works very well for southern pine beetle. You know, I really believe that thinning has got to play a, a large role in in the way we move forward with our forests. Uh, southern pine beetle, it works so great. You know, there's sort of mixed results a little bit on mountain pine beetle. You know, different stands have called it, our studies have called it beetle proofing when you thin. Um, and I, I wonder if, if it's really the fact that you've increased the vigor of the tree or you've changed the microsite conditions. But it has been demonstrated to have some level of e efficacy. And I think what more importantly it does is it uh, gets rid of this real density problem. You know, fires used to burn across across the, you know, probably the entire continent, whether through Native American burning or lightning exitions, pretty regularly, like anywhere from 8 to 20 years or 30 years in a lot of stands. A lot of these stands are 120 years out now with no fire disturbance. And this creates very, when fires start, very aggressive fire behavior. And it's, you know, this densification of forests. I think we need to be moving toward a thinner less dense future in across our forests in North America because this this western pine beetle outbreak in California its breadth uh, has really demonstrated that a lot of the forests here are under stress and are not resilient and I single out California because unlike some of the other states like Montana Idaho Colorado it hasn't had really big uh, outbreaks in the past that have like impacted a lot of area where the LA Times and the San Francisco Chronicle are writing about it constantly. Uh, this drought really triggered off a very large western pine beetle outbreak and I think the way to move toward a more resilient condition is through that long-term and direct approach which is how we how can we impact the composition and the structure. Otis said, um, knowing that southern pine beetle is not your specialty, what they're dealing with there in Georgia, could you recommend anything for southern pine beetle for more than a few trees on a homeowner's property where the sprays exceed the chemical allowance per acre? So this is where you're going to really want to work probably with a registered professional forester. But, you know, the thing you can do for southern pine beetle is identify currently infested trees so trees that aren't red, so they actually have bark beetles underneath them. And, you know, a lot of these dendroctinists have pretty obvious signals of when they've mass attacked a tree, like frass, so that's like little sawdust on the outside of the bark, or pitch tubes. Uh, these are kind of globular resin blobs the tree produces. And then you kind of hack into the bark. Is there live beetle under there? Is your tree still green and you got live beetle? Then you have a currently infested tree. And the amazing thing about southern pine beetle is if you fall that tree you don't even have to remove it that will end that bark beetles life cycle if only this was the case in mountain pine beetle mm -hmm. um, and so that's really uh, an ability to be pretty direct with that insect and then you know you're worried about fuel loads and whatnot you can either chip that tree wait for those beetles to die and then be cutting things up for firewood but probably working with um, southern resource um, Southern Resources in the Forest Service and Extension. Dave Coyle is an Extension specialist out of Georgia. Uh, is a really good uh, approach. Dave's here and he says, we don't use verbenone for Southern Pine Beetle. We use management strategies, i.e. thinning. They work very well. So right, you're right on with what he's saying. Um, I'm going to ask Mark to launch our polls before... Um, too many more people check out of our webinar. We have a couple more questions to address, so uh, please feel free to stick with us, and Jody will graciously stick around to um, answer your questions. Uh, Blaine asked, what should public land managers, i.e. BLM, Forest Service, National Parks do differently to deal with these pests? Kind of a big question. Yeah, it is a big question. You know, I really think it comes down to, um, you know, the question I've been hearing a lot uh, is, why are we getting these big outbreaks of bark beetles? You know, what's changed in the, you know, are we, are we doing something wrong? Is, is, you know, are there, are there predators all gone, etc. And, you know, it, that's a complicated answer, but ultimately the eruptive bark beetles, uh, 
the dendroctinous groups and the pinion hips, they are eruptive bark beetles and they do have outbreaks. And I think if we try to um, expect them more, because I think we forget about them. Uh, we certainly saw this in British Columbia. T over 10 million acres were wiped, a million hectares were wiped out and people forgot very quickly about the mountain pine beetle after that outbreak subsided. So we need to expect it more. You know, in terms of the climate, climate adaptation side of things, you know, Diana Six is doing some work with the genetics of uh, primarily lodgepole pine and mountain pine beetle. And maybe these insects are helping our forests adapt by killing off the poorly adapted uh, species, the species, the, the, or it's not species, the trees that are no longer as well adapted to the current climate conditions as trees that don't die. I think the only answer ultimately uh, for public land managers is to try to bring uh, the public around to the idea of density management. You know, there's a lot of, I think, sort of distrust that thinning is just a way to get at saw log timber, which is not entirely a bad thing. You know, a lot of rural communities would benefit from some level of larger tree extraction. And when I say large tree extraction, I do not mean those massive, beautiful legacy trees, those monsters that were left behind from old gold mining or old logging days. I mean, you know, these sort of moderate, uh, it's not a great way to phrase it, but you know, these trees with sort of 30, 30 centimeter to probably 50 centimeter diameters, take a few of those out to pay for the much needed thinnings. Um, think about how we can increase species heterogeneity. California's got a lot of that because of the mixed conifer ecosystems, but in other ecosystems, how can we have more heterogeneity of species? Because these bark beetles are specific. So if you get mountain pie beetle, it wipes out the pine. But you get spruce beetle, it marks out the spruce. If it's some sort of mix, you're not losing everything at once. Probably a bit of a wishy-washy answer, but it, that's a hard one. Um, with longer, hotter years occurring, are there going to be multiple generations of mountain pine beetle per year in high elevation areas? I think in high elevation areas, we're still looking very much at a univoltine life cycle where it takes one full year for for the, uh, the insect to fulfill its life cycle. I think at the lower elevations, that's the big question. And so uh, bark beetle biologists, I think, are really actively looking at that because these insects are very driven by temperature. And the longer, the earlier the spring and the later the winter happens, the more activity these uh, bark beetles can have within a single year. And so when we start to see spruce beetle go from a semi-voltine, so taking up two years to fulfill its life cycle to single, will we start to see mountain pine beetle have more than one generation a year? It's absolutely possible. Mm. And uh, I know folks are working on that, which is, which will help us get a sense of that. Do you, uh, is there, what are your thoughts on the use of bark beetle traps? to help reduce populations of bark beetles? Yeah, traps have been actually found to be really ineffective. They're a good way to monitor kind of flight windows and sort of whether kind of your, your duration and pulses, your peak beetle act activity times, but they're not actually effective for removing, reducing the population. It seems like it should be, but uh, they're, really, they're really a monitoring tool. And I'm always nervous for landowners to use them because those aggregation pheromones, so the pheromones that would attract the beetle, work extremely well. And there's no guarantee that bark beetle's gonna hit a trap. You could very easily hit a host tree on the way, so you can really create a problem by concentrating beetles in an area to use those traps. You mentioned felling a, a tree to act as a host tree mm -hmm. um, at one point. So what would you do with that tree once it's got, once it's infested, would you, remove it entirely, I guess, if it was a, as a host tree. Yeah, try. once it's once it's sort of filled up with beetle, then I would be getting rid of that tree. So okay. debarking and burning the bark, you could always keep the tree as uh, firewood, but you'd want to get rid of that bark because that's the insects are underneath the bark in that sort of phloem cambium layer. So that's the part you want to destroy. You know, um, un ambrosia beetles and whatnot will go actually into the wood, but the dendroctinus and the ips will stay in that outer part of the tree. But once that trap has been filled up, then yeah, you want to deal with it. 
you don't want them to let it go to the next season. And I've seen that happen. And now you just got a, you just brought a whole bunch of bark beetles in that then fly out and hit all your green trees. So oh, okay. follow up uh, action is really important. Otis asks, are there studies documenting that felling and not dealing with the infested debris is okay for Southern pine beetle management? Yes, there are. So um, I, there's a really good, uh, I'm just going to get on my phone so I can find the, um, it's a recent uh, synthesis of all the Southern pine beetle work that the U.S. Forest Service Region 8 did. And it's uh, 2016 or 2017. And it is by, uh, if I can find my sent mail, I just have to send the reference to somebody. That's why I think I can actually find this. So it's called, it's by Colson and Kleepzig. It's 2011. And it's called, it's a general technical report, SRS 140. So if you go to Region 8, this is a free PDF and it's a very uh, fulsome um, exhaustive, it's 512 pages of how you treat about the biology, what works and what doesn't. And that's a great resource for Southern Pine Beetle. Great. Um, Roy asked, I recently heard, uh, heard that audio, conf heard that audio confession through the playing of beetle chirps may be helpful in tree protection. Is there any validity to this defense? So this is a really neat study and patent that just came out. So this is work by Richard Hofstetter at University of um, Northern Arizona. And he worked with a fellow, uh, like an acoustic specialist, uh, at one of the UC campuses in Santa Cruz. And that's exactly what they did. They piped in music of uh, competing beetles, of their own beetles, into trees. And, you know... It's going to take some further research, but it, the early research shows this actually was sort of effective at reducing the amount of infestation levels in, in trees. Now, again, this is a single tree treatment because they're actually putting these speakers like right kind of in the tree. So you're not just blaring out beetle chirps to the surrounding area. And I spoke with Richard specifically about the study, and, and the, the one caveat he had is, Right now, the, the acoustics only travel so far up the tree, and beetles can attack all the way, you know, they tend to attack all the way to the top until the top is too small uh, for them to like it. And so getting that acoustic signal to propagate up the tree is, is kind of the, now the next trick. But I think it's an interesting line of research, and I think what's really cool about it is the acoustic behavior of bark beetles hasn't been really well looked at. Yeah. And this is a, this, if this works as a, as a single tree protection effort, you're not using any chemicals. And I think that would be appealing to a lot of people. So it's research underway and the early stages show that there is some level of uh, protection offered by this. Excellent. Brian asked, and I think I'll just have you send me the, that citation for the SRS 140 yeah. publication. And then um, we'll put that out in our next email blast to everybody. So I think you did an excellent job addressing all of our questions today, and thank you so much for summarizing this very complicated, um, complex topic. And um, if you are still with us, please take the poll, the three-question poll, very quickly. It helps us do our job better and um, helps me as an extension educator and helps Mark as well. So thanks, Jody. Thanks, Mark. Thank and, you. Um, have a wonderful day, everybody. Thanks, folks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.